the Catholic Church and you talk about priesthood, you also talk about celibacy because to become a priest, they take a vow to be celibate. But many priests are taking daring steps against the Catholic Church and marrying. Now, how do you feel about this? Should Catholic priests have the right to marry and raise a family and continue to work as a priest within the Catholic Church, continue within their career? Call 641-1298 right now and reserve your seats to Monday's Twin Cities Live. Monday we're going to be talking about this, and we're going to meet three married priests and their wives. Uh, if you're Catholic or even if you're a non-Catholic, uh, this is an issue that's been debated for quite some time, and I hope you'll come down and join me here in the studio audience and speak out on this issue that will be argued for some time. It's priests who decide to marry Monday on Twin Cities Live. The number to call for tickets, 641-1298. Good morning, happy Halloween, and go ahead with your question. Nice to have you with us this morning. Go ahead. Are you there? Hello? Yes, go ahead yes. with your question. I guess I'd like, just like to, it's kind of a comment. I okay. would just like to say that I think they're sadly mistaken that they don't believe that Satanism is alive today. It is very alive, and that's how they derive their power. Well, to be, the, to be uh, fair to these gentlemen, I don't believe that you said that Satanism is not alive. No, no. not at all. I believe you said that the, the religion of Wicca, you just, that you in, you don't worship Satan. Exactly. exactly. But there are exactly. Satanists. Of course there are. We yes. just are not them. Yeah. Is there any crossover between witchcraft and... There shouldn't be. No. Uh, there are people who believe in Satan and who worship him for whatever warped reasons. I, I have no idea. But there are people like that. So we're not saying there is no such thing as Satanism. But so it has nothing believe... to do with witchcraft. Witches do not believe in Satan and therefore do not worship him. The caller may also think that Buddhists or Jews worship Satan too. Since they don't accept her own personal view of deity. Mm -hmm. Is that so true? Caller? Caller? Yes, I am. I would just like to say that I wonder, where do they think that they derive their power then? I said it is natural. Everybody has these powers. We have simply worked towards... Um, you, you can say <laughs> that the power comes uh, from divinity, from deity. Uh, how you view that deity is, a, is another question. Uh, okay. The, the so powers that we have within us come from God, if you like. Now, if you want to call God Jesus, that's fine. If we want to call God by the names we use for our God and Goddess, that's fine. But they come from deity through us. What are the names you use? Uh, different traditions use different names. There are many traditions within witchcraft, just as there are denominations within Christianity. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, could you show us some of your power? Anyhow, you know, so we can believe you more? How do we know you're witches? Okay. <laughs> Quite frankly, we don't care whether you believe or not. No, we're not here to, we're well, not here to give a display. Answer. And if you had, say, the Archbishop of Canterbury here, would you ask him to do a mass to show that he really was, exactly. <laughs> was an archbishop? I don't ask my Christian friends, and I do have some. I don't ask them to prove they're Christians or prove they can pray to Christ. How long, how long have witches been around? They've been around for thousands of years. Uh, the late Dr. Margaret Murray did some extensive research, and she traced them back, she thought, to Paleolithic times, which is 25,000 years ago. Uh, I don't honestly think that witchcraft per se goes back that far. Uh, certainly religion does. This was the, the, the root of, of religion. But witchcraft, as we know it today, uh, certainly from a thousand or, or more years before Christianity, um, there was a big revival, however, in the 1950s when it was thought that witchcraft had died out, but in actual fact it hadn't, and, and it revived. Approximately how many people follow the Wicca religion? It's very difficult to say because, as Scott mentioned earlier, covens are autonomous. They, they are groups with, uh, just unto themselves. There's no one leader of all witches. There's no witch pope or witch king or witch queen or anything like that. But it's certainly in the, in the, I would say, tens of thousands. At least, yes. Uh, one uh, large pagan publication has a mailing list of, I think, 20,000. Let me work my way around here, Abby. Go ahead, stand up for me, please. If I, had, uh, if I wanted to become a witch, where would I go? Do you have a building, a location to go? Are you in the Yellow Pages? No. The best... <laughs> The best, tech school. I mean, uh, no, the best way to do it is to read. Is to read. Just like you would study any other religion before you enter it, you certainly want to know everything about the religion before you become 
a member of it. When we talk about a religion, usually we talk about uh, whether it's Christianity or, or, or talk about the Jews or whatever. Mm -hmm. They have one set of principles and one set of laws exactly. that they follow. But it appears to me that you're saying that anyone can go and read a couple of books and decide that they're a witch. So really, no, is no, that a religion? No, no, Isn't no. it just a they bunch of individuals deciding that they want to do they something on their own? They don't decide they become a witch. It has to be a conscious decision to work towards becoming one. And eventually, through your uh, private study, you eventually probably find someone who is a member, and they can help train you into uh, the finer aspects of the religion. The, w the way I found witchcraft was by reading various books and then writing to authors of those books. The ones which I found made sense, which seemed right to me, I wrote to the authors, started a correspondence. Through that, I was put in touch with groups, met the people there, found the ones that I felt comfortable with, and took the step from there. So it's, it's a lengthy process, which is don't advertise and they don't proselytize. So it's not easy to find witches. You've got to hunt. And the best way, as Scott said, is through reading, through then contacting the author and making further contacts from there. Okay, uh, you said that you believe in a god and a goddess. Now I'm just wondering, do they have different roles that you look up to either one and is one uh, more superior than the other? Okay, first of all, we don't believe. Belief seems to indicate there's a doubt as to whether something is real or not. I know that they exist. This is basically, I think, the powers behind all gods and goddesses, all deities ever worshipped, are the same. They're there. Whatever you want to call them, however you look at them or turn them. I just rever them as these specific twin deities. And they have specific um, attributes and histories and names, but you can pick and choose from various different ancient cultures. Now, before you ask your question, I want to ask you the vision you have of a witch. What does a witch look like? Um, I don't know, with a pointy hat. And, <laughs> and what else? The past. The pointy hat and what oh. else? Um, long ba black cloak or something. Something black and, and the broom. scary looking. <laughs> and a funny looking nose with a big ward on it. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I would, I'm a little disappointed, guys. There's no pointy uh, hat, uh, no... So, no. <laughs> I flew in here on Northwest, not yeah. in a broom. <laughs> <laughs> and my broom sticks in for an oil change. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Your broom is in for a what? An oil change. An oil change. <laughs> Well, do you ever use your powers to promote evil or in any negative way? No. As Ray said, we have one law, and you harm none. Do what thou will. There's also a, a belief which goes along with that, a belief that whatever one does returns threefold. So if you do good to someone, you're going to get back three times the good. So if you want to go out and do good. If you do evil, you're going to get three, back three times the evil. So who wants that? So there's certainly no inducement to, to do harm. Good morning, you're on Twin Cities Live. Go ahead with your question. Yes, I would like to commend the older gentleman in his response to the lady who called in, uh, expressing the viewpoint that the Bible was the only book, the only answer, the only right way. I think it is a far more healthier attitude when you acknowledge that there are several paths to the center, to the force, to whatever is right for us. There is more than one way. and people who claim or feel that, that they have the answer and the only solution are far more dangerous to us as individuals and to our society as a whole. I agree absolutely and I, I thank you for that. Uh, I think that um, when we, we do acknowledge others, it's fine for, for people to have different views and to follow those and believe what they believe so long as they're not trying to force those views on others. Absolutely. I think it is a supreme egotism to believe that one's own accepted religion is a perfect religion for all. When we come back, I want to talk to our two witches today, Scott and Ray, about what Halloween means to them. This is the big day if you're a witch. We want to find out why when we continue on Twin Cities Live. <laughs> I'd like to show you why Kozlak's Royal Oak Restaurant in Suburban Shoreview is one of my favorite restaurants in all America. Great food, lunch and dinner. Fabulous New Orleans Sunday Jazz Brunch. The gardens, dining with delightful views. Outstanding private party and meeting facilities. A knowledgeable, caring staff. Come enjoy with me the beauty and bounty that is Kozlak's Royal Oak Restaurant.
I think that Ben Weber understands the farmer's problem. In my case, he was very helpful. And I think Ben Weber has been an excellent congressman. Wouldn't be for Ben in his office. We wouldn't be farming today. I feel Ben Weber has worked hard to create a better business climate out here. And that's going to mean better jobs for people in rural Minnesota. This office belongs to the people of the 2nd District. When they've got problems, we'll work day and night to find solutions. This is the first time I've ever realized that congressmen are there to help you. We've got you covered with style, designer style. We've got you covered with savings from 25 to 40% off every day. We've got you covered with natural fabrics and coats, suits, and sportswear. We've got you covered with selection, simply thousands of coats to choose from. We've got you covered with value that endures season after season. So coat yourself in selection, quality, and value now at The Coat Company. It's coming. The biggest weekend ever at Canterbury Downs. Fifteen races on Saturday, November 1st, featuring the Breeders' Cup. Seven championship thoroughbred races worth $10 million, simulcast live from Santa Anita. On Sunday, November 2nd, it's the $100,000 Dan Patch Pace, featuring the country's best pacers. See two spectacular days of racing, including the Breeders' Cup, both for just $3 at Canterbury Downs. Put this picture in your mind for just a moment. You're 40 years old, uh, you've grown up, you've got experience, you've got a job, you've got a husband, and bam, just like that, you've got a mind of a baby. That's the condition that Beverly Slater was in when she awoke in the hospital after a terrible car accident. She was a victim of total amnesia. Total, everything, gone. Tuesday on Twin Cities Live, we'll meet the woman portrayed by Lindsay Wagner in the upcoming movie, A Stranger in My Bed. Now, meet the stranger, her husband. I mean, this is a woman that 40 years old, and all of a sudden, the next day she wakes up, she has no idea who her husband is. 641-1298 is the number to call for free studio tickets. should be just a, an incredible show. You can be part of our studio audience and find out what it's like to have your past totally erased from your memory. I hope you come down and join me. 641-1298. Call right now and reserve your seats. Well, let's go right to the source here and ask, how did Halloween come about and what does it mean to a witch? Halloween originated way back about 20,000 years ago. Uh, at that time, man and woman, humankind, depended upon hunting to exist. Uh, they used to hunt animals and so a god of hunting came into being. Uh, a little later, they developed agriculture and a goddess came into being with a, uh, looking after fertility, fertility of the crops. And the year was pretty much divided then into two halves. A half of the year during the winter when they would hunt for food and the summer half when they could grow food. And the division of the, the year was at Halloween, as it is now, and at what we call Beltane, which is uh, the, um, the beginning of, of uh, March. Of, excuse me. <laughs> May. My mind is gone. Beginning of May. Um, so you've got the, the year divided in, into two. Um, Halloween, or Samhain, which is the old name for it, then is this, this change of season from the summer to the winter. And it is a big time in witchcraft because this is a time when we feel that we get together to celebrate, to see the change of emphasis from the goddess to the god, and we feel that also at this time you can speak with the spirits of people who have died, during the preceding year, you can get together with old friends, in effect. So what are you time. going to be doing tonight? Are you going to have a, what do they call it, seance? Or? It's not a seance. That belongs to spiritualism. But a circle, a, a gathering, a meeting. Uh, Will you a do coven, that tonight? A coven meeting. Unfortunately, we're away from home. But I think there's a possibility we might be invited to a local, a local gathering. But it will be a celebration, a time for celebration. Um, I was just wondering if the kids of the witches believe that Halloween is anything different, or if it's normal, like to any normal. It's almost like Christmas to a Christian. It's the big festival of the year, the big fun time of the year, the big celebration of the year. So, which kids thoroughly enjoy it? Good Who's morning. Here? You're on Twin Cities Live. Excuse me. Go right ahead. Are you there? Call yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, Christians believe there's life after death, and I was just wondering. Uh, what do witches have to look forward to? Is there any life after death? We believe there are many lives after death. We uh, 
embrace the doctrine of reincarnation, as many millions of people do in the Far East. Go ahead, you had a question down front. Um, I was wondering, what is the relationship between your deities, um, brother and sister, or... Well, there are many and different wife. myths or stories uh, told about them. Uh, sometimes they're brother and sister, sometimes they're husband and wife. Uh, some witches believe that they created everything in existence. Uh, some that witches believe they were here after everything in creation was created. It uh, just depends. Again, uh, Wicca is a very individual religion, and if you have ten witches answering the same question, they'll give you at least thirteen answers. What do you do for a living? I'm a writer. That's what I do for a living. So. I write... Uh, not only books on Wicca and the occult, but also books, uh, I write westerns, gothics, romances, men's action, and I also do car columns, uh, syndicated columns about car upkeep and maintenance. How often do you get together as a group and worship your gods and stuff, and um, do you have a day set aside besides like Halloween where you do get together and have your meetings? Or yes, it probably depends on the individual group. Some covens meet at least once a week. Uh, the day they meet is whatever day is most convenient for all of them, and I think most of them meet on a Saturday uh, simply because you can stay up late, you don't have to go to work the next day, very mundane reasons. Uh, it depends on the group. Some only meet once a month. You have, as I say, major festivals throughout the year, eight during the year, Samhain and Beltane being the, the two major ones. The other, the minor meetings, the weekly meetings, are referred to as esbats, but it depends on the group how often they want to meet. Scott, what's the most amazing thing that you've seen in, in one of these gatherings? I mean, what something that really, even if you're a witch, kind of surprised you? Well, I think you could perhaps ask a Christian the most amazing thing they saw at one of their services. Um, the things that occurred during... Yeah, but we don't have Christians here today. We have witches. So I, I see. You I know, see. I mean, what you get together and you have, like he said, uh, Ray... Tonight, if you get together, uh, and I'm sure on past Halloween, let's, let's narrow it down a little bit. Past Halloween, when you've gotten together, have you talked to someone, a spirit? or have I you have, yes. Uh, one circle I was at many years ago, one of the um, people most responsible for the resurgence of witchcraft was the late Dr. Gerald Gardner. And I knew Gerald very well when he was alive. He died in 1962. And... At a circle, the, the Halloween after his death, I saw him there in the circle. He appeared and he seemed to be as, as full-bodied as, as anybody else there in the circle. Uh, he didn't say anything. He walked around the outside of the circle smiling and nodding to us. And then he just disappeared again. And that, I think, is the, the most surprising thing that I've ever seen. But I've seen things like, uh, we usually do things, uh, our religious rites are practiced within a circle, basically, a circular shape. It's sort of like the temple itself is a circle. I've seen things like lights uh, moving around outside. Um, I've usually seen more things like ghosts and images and things like that when I've investigated haunted houses. But usually our uh, relig religious rituals are pretty much religious. Yes, when, um, when I think of witchcraft or the Wicca religion, I think of ancient times, say back in Europe, as where it started. What's the difference between that religion and Americanism for Wicca, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Is there a difference? Do you still practice the same faith, belief? That's, uh, that's a good question. Most people's idea of European, early European witchcraft is, of course, the, the um, propaganda that's been given by the church over the, the years of the tall pointed hat and the ugly crone type thing. But uh, witchcraft in Europe was in the form of groups of witches, covens, meeting together to worship their gods, much as we've discussed so far this morning. The American variety is pretty much the same. I did mention that there are different denominations of witchcraft, right? We've got Celtic witches, Saxon witch witches, Gardnerian witches, Druidic witches. So depending on the group, it will depend on how the, the meeting goes, the format of it. Uh, but the Celtic witches, for instance, follow exactly the same sort of rituals that the Celtic witches in Europe follow. The Saxon witches, the same thing. There are one or two... Um, traditions which were founded here in this country, and so they have their own little idiosyncrasies, but they all follow pretty much the same general pattern. Although, of course, things have been modernized a little bit because we don't have the same mind space as people did in 1300, 1400s in Europe. We're Thank much smarter. Excuse me. Thank you for holding on the line. You have your chance now to talk to Scott Cunningham or 
uh, Ray Buckland, who are, these men are witches. They say they're witches. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what uh, the significance is of the pentagram and if that's a part of the occult or if it's part of witchcraft. It is a part of the occult generally, but it has been pretty much adopted by witchcraft. The pentagram, for those who don't know, it's that five-pointed star, the interconnecting points of, of the star, and it symbolizes life itself. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Egyptian onk, the thing that looks a little like a crucifix but with a, a loop at the top. That was the Egyptian symbol for life. Well, the pentagram is almost a European version of that. In some of the old books on magic, you'll see a man or a woman standing with their arms outstretched and their legs apart and a pentagram superimposed on them. So it symbolizes the life force. Witches use that quite a bit, use that as their symbol. Unfortunately, Satanists have also adopted that, though you, they usually reverse it as they do everything. So they have the five-pointed star with the two points at the top, and they sometimes have it superimposed on a goat's head with the two points for the horns and the ears and the, the chin of the goat. No accounting for taste. No <laughs> accounting for taste. Well, we will continue with our tune-up for Halloween, talking with witches and talking about witchcraft on Twin Cities Live. So don't go away. We'll be right back.